more than just that, like the things that the numbers aren't necessarily going to track, you you talk about, I mean, yes, sir, Hello and welcome to episode 259 of section 138. I'm your host, Mark Colley, as always, joined by Bryson and Jacob. The Blue Jays come away with their first series win of 2023. They take three of four from the Kansas City Royals. They get a Shaky start in the first game with Jose Barrios on the mound, but then everyone else, Yusei Kikuchi, Alec Manoa, and Kevin Gosman put up solid starts as well as the offense, putting up great hitting numbers, and they come away with the first series win of the season. Jacob, Bryson, how are you guys? I think everyone can exhale now after uh, the last four days here, of course. It didn't start off great in terms of the actual series in Kansas City. However, throughout the series, as you mentioned, Mark, things seem to kind of I guess kind of come back down to earth a little bit in terms of struggling. And uh, this team was able to win three straight and pretty much has turned around this road trip. So I think everyone's kind of a little bit relieved that that's all happened. And uh, this team's showing a little or playing a little bit more like that we were supposed to expect at the beginning of the year. I think they just, they look more complete. And, and I mean, there were some shaky pitching performances and even the offense kind of was a little dry at times, but Taking three out of four out of the Royals, not expected to be a very good team. And they shut down Bobby Witt Jr., which I'm not the happiest about. But overall, I think it was a very good series. You're going into the weekend facing the Angels. And I mean, I mean, you look at today, the Rogers Center renovations were just shown. I think it's a good time. And now they're going into this weekend, and then we have the home opener. And I think, like you said, we can exhale a little bit. This isn't the end of the world. Yeah, you lost two out of three, or you lost three straight then going into that Royals series. But you got what you expected out of this team and you got a lot of unexpected performances in a good way. So I think it, it overall is a very good series. Yeah. I think, you know, you're bound to overreact after the first series of the season. I think we saw that with a lot of blue Jay fans, but hopefully this series helps put some of us at ease with some of the concerns that we had. Although obviously there is a big elephant in the room that we're going to get through to with the guy who started the first game of this season, but at least now we can take a little bit of a deep breath, sit back, relax, look at the results that the Blue Jays are putting up and enjoy them a little bit more. So let's start with one of the positives from this past series, and that's Dalton Varsho, because he put up one hell of a series. We kind of saw glimpses of it in the first series against St. Louis. I know the first game he had that outfield assist where he cut off the ball, and then he also had an outfield assist in this series, but I think what we saw from him this series was kind of his coming out party with the Blue Jays. And I think a lot of fans now recognize him as this great talent. And, you know, obviously he's going to run into hot and cold streaks and we can't expect him to keep up this performance for the entire season because judging based on his previous stats, it is unsustainable. But I think this series really served as a wake up call for his potential with the Blue Jays, what he can do both defensively and offensively and how much of a tool he can be for the Blue Jays this season. So credit where credit is due, we often start with the negative stuff, and we're going to get to the negative stuff with one guy in particular. But I do want to heap praise on Dalton Varsho for being not only fantastic in this series, fantastic in this season, but kind of coming out and showing Blue Jay fans what he's capable of and why they went and spent so much in the offseason in terms of trade assets to get him. Yeah, I mean, honestly, with Dalton Varsho, you're looking at it four out of, uh, or sorry, four at bats per game, 16 at bats total, seven for 16. I know we can't necessarily look at raw stats right now. You're not going to look at ERA and batting average, OBP, none of that. But when you look at what he was able to do, he's putting the bat on the ball. He's getting a lot of hard contact. The balls are going you know, deep into the outfield. And even you look at more than just that, like the things that the numbers aren't necessarily going to track. You, you talk about, I mean, they are going to track the outfield assist, but that was a perfect throw. Like you even see Dan Shulman on the broadcast. Like he was like, eh, okay, he's going to throw it. And then, as the ball got closer to home plate, he just starts elevating his voice and raising his voice. He's like, holy, like this, this ball's like, he gunned it right to home plate. And he's doing a lot of great things, even on the base pass. Like you're seeing, yeah, he's pretty fast, but he's also smart on the base pass. Like he knows when it's uh, like a bloop single or whatever is kind of going to drop or if it's not. And you're just seeing a lot more of a mature, I think, team out of the Blue Jays. And it's because of guys like this and even Kevin Kiermeyer. And another guy that I want to talk about is somebody like Matt Chapman, obviously just barely missed a, uh, and just barely missed a three run home run today, but talking about what he was able to do in this series, like it obviously, so he had, um, he had uh, 15 at bats, just one less than, than uh, Dalton Varsho, but 
you know, again, you're constantly seeing two hits, three hits, one hit, one hit. So he had a hit in every single game. He's driving in just a ton of runs, two runs today, two runs the other day, one run the the, the game before that. He and Matt and uh, Dalton Varsho, they're doing, you know, a lot of the power here. And even Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and, and Bo Bichette, like we talked about how oh, they're going to lose the, the, the offense out of Guriel and Hernandez. Well, early showings that they're not really losing any offense. Like, yeah, they kind of went on a losing streak, but they're not losing any offense out of these guys. And they're not only that, but they're gaining, I think, a lot of baseball IQ. And I'm pretty sure I've mentioned that every episode since the season started. But I really do want to emphasize that. Like, they are truly getting a much more focused team. And I guess maybe the one time where they weren't focused was when Vladdy hit that home run today um, and he fake put on a jacket and fake posed for it. But, I mean, it's, it's a fun gesture, whatever. But I think it, it's true that this team truly is focused and yeah they go on a losing streak but they know that they're capable of winning and then even you look at Yusei Kaguchi easily one of his best starts as a Blue Jay I know it's early I know it's against the Royals but he completely rebounded and you can see the emotion out of him that he wants this and I think that this team it's it's looking a lot better and I know I was very pessimistic I said they were they were going to split it but I'm happy to be wrong in this scenario like this team genuinely does look really really good and a lot of rebounds out of the pitching bullpen was a little bit shaky but specifically fo focusing on the offense and guys like Varsho and Chapman. I think that what they're doing right now cannot be said enough. Like they are, I don't want to say carrying the team, but they are one of the reasons why this team just took three out of four from the Royals. And one of the reasons why they even won a game against the Cardinals. So I'm very pleased with what I'm seeing. And yeah, you mentioned the fact that Varsho's really only played one full season in the big leagues. One, I mean, he didn't, he didn't play left field last season much. He was primarily a right fielder, but I mean, you can you can make that transition, but you're looking at what he's capable of doing, and it makes sense why the Blue Jays went out and and got rid of somebody like Lourdes Gurriel Jr. and a very highly touted prospect in Gabriel Moreno. It's because guys like this help you win in the regular season and when it matters. And so I think that going forward, he's going to be a cornerstone of this team because I mean, well, he's here for a long time, but it's very exciting to watch him. And I I feel like I don't know, you guys can say this if you agree, but I feel like every inning or at least every two innings, there is somebody on the broadcast bringing up something that Don Varsho did that needs a little bit of extra attention. And I think he's just, he's, he went into this as a bit of an underrated player. If you're not like a diehard, watch every game, watch every aspect of the off season type of fan. But a lot of people are going to really like this guy. And I wouldn't be surprised if you see a lot of Varsho jerseys throughout the season. And I know exactly on this podcast who's going to get a, a Varsho jersey based off the last couple of episodes, and it's going to be you, Jacob. But of course, I mean, <laughs> I mean for Dalton Varsho, um, I get like you were talking. You guys were pretty much talking about it at the top. Easily by far, uh, in my opinion, one of the best uh, players of this series, uh, and it's not even close of what we saw. I mean, Jacob, you pretty much gave an in-depth uh, explanation on almost everything. But I mean, yeah, I mean, I kind of, I basically had a lot of the same stuff in terms of that great defensive play that he made on Tuesday night, I believe it was when Yusei Kikuchi um, was pitching. And the part for me that made it so important was that this was the same inning where Yusei Kikuchi got the solo home run. Uh, and then, you know, I guess at the time you're hoping that it doesn't unravel for him because we've seen starts, or I should, I guess in comparison to a guy like Barrios, when it unravels for you, it completely goes off the rails. And I think that was just the main idea here was that Kikuchi gave up that home run and uh, to, it was Fred Mil Reyes who uh, hit the home run. And then afterward, Varsha was able to help him out to get out of that inning. And obviously uh, by doing that, he, he guns down Matt Duffy at the plate. So I think that was a huge part, not only for Varsha, but I think it really also helped Kikuchi and it really helped the game turn out the way it did because he was able to help him out. And um, I mean, you, you saw, you know, I think a lot of us were familiar with the routes he would take in terms of him being defense or him running routes in the outfield. I think the one part where we didn't know the a whole lot about was his arm strength. And I think that was all, also uh, highlighted from what we saw as well from that throw. I mean, it was a bullet to the plate. I think uh, they were talking on Statcast. It was around, I think it was around 87 miles per hour, his thrower. It was around th that uh, area or that marker to home plate uh, when he did get Matt Duffy out at the plate. I mean, it just shows you how accurate it was, number one. And number two, just how perfect the row was, uh, the running or running into the, the fly ball and able to to uh, gun it out as quickly as he did. So that was the other part for it. I think there was a another play on the base pass where even they were just highlighting where he, he hit a single, he was going to pretty much transition it into a double, and then he was able to quickly, I guess, read it, 
and then go back to first base. And usually a lot of people keep going in that situation. And then there's going to be a play at second base, even if, if it's close or not. So just seeing his, I guess, his IQ as the word that Jacob has been using a lot to, you know, correct yourself on those plays or just make the safe play and make the right play. And a lot of it's been done quietly. I think that's uh, very important for his production to this team. And of course, offensively as well. I mean, he's collecting hits left, right, and center. And when he's hitting the ball, he's hitting the ball hard. Uh, there is hard contact. And I think that's the other part for me that I am really, or I take a lot away from is that a lot of these hits are solid. And we're talking, you know, exit velocity, just being high, everything like that is just being solid about it. He's finding holes in the field. He's hitting the ball all over the place. I mean, his home run that he hit in this series, which which was opposite field, I think they were saying how usually he doesn't hit it opposite field when he's uh, hitting home runs. But the, the fact that he was able to spread the ball across the field, I think that was a huge thing as well. And of course, coming into this year, he got rid of the toe tap uh, at the plate compared to what he did last year in the previous years. And obviously it's working out for him so far. And there was just kind of, I wouldn't say concerns, but there was a lot of people talking about how there was a little bit of a slow start to the spring for him. But of course, near that last couple of week range, he really started to turn it up. And I think we mentioned it a few times on this on this episode or on this podcast as well. And the fact that he was able to carry it over to him or with him to the regular season, I think that's even more important. So, you know, I think a lot of it was the fact that just there was a lot of unfamiliarity with Dalton Varsho of who he was. And perhaps that's why it's kind of taken him a little bit or not a little bit, but it's, you know, these plays are introducing himself to this fan base and showing, you know, the ball player he really is, how smart he is, you know, how serious he takes the game, all that stuff. And I think he's really pretty much showing off a very good first impression and the potential that he can be uh, on this team. And it's a very important part of this team by far. Yeah, it's kind of like that uh, Shaquille O'Neal meme. I'm sorry I wasn't familiar with your game. That's kind of the situation that we're in right now. Like, sorry, Dalton, we didn't know you were going to be this good. And yet he has been to start the season. And, you know, I fell victim to this in the off season and kind of goes back to what you were saying, Bryson, the fact that, you know, we didn't really know his arm strength. I didn't really know his bat. And that's kind of what I underestimated him in. Um, you know, I expected him to come in here and be this guy who the Blue Jays are primarily relying on for defensive prowess, for his defensive success, for what he brings to the team in the outfield. And, I wasn't expecting him to contribute a whole lot offensively. I was expecting him, you know, maybe a six or seven hole in the lineup. You know, you look at his previous stats, he had a 109 OPS plus last season in Arizona, 102 the season prior in 2021, also with Arizona. So I wasn't expecting huge contributions, right? Right around average, a little bit above average. And yet we come into this season. I know it's early. I know we got all those caveats and that's going to be a caveat for the next month or so until we get to that what is it, 200 at-bat plateau or 100, whatever the number is that people refer to as hitters getting really comfortable in their skin. And so that's going to be a caveat we have with him, but I'm really impressed with what we've seen so far this season. And you got to be happy and you got to keep praise on him because, you know, give credit where credit is due. He's carrying the Blue Jays so far, or at least helping that offense be as potent as it was in this past series in Kansas City. Um, while we're on the topic of positives, we mentioned it a couple times when we were going around the horn you say Kikuchi was incredible in his first start. He got pulled a little bit early. I got to be honest, I would have liked to see him go an extra inning. His pitch count was low enough. However, I understand the case where you want him to get off on the right foot. You don't want to try him in his first start because we know how fragile, I guess, he is right now. We know how temperamental he is right now or how temperamental he could be, at least what we saw last season. And so you don't want to mess with that. So I understand the decision, but the baseball fan in me wants to see him go out, get another inning under his belt. But I mean, look, bottom line, he had a phenomenal start. As a Blue Jay fan, you can't ask for anything better from Yusei Kikuchi. And if the Blue Jays are getting that from him every fifth day, obviously there's going to be blips in the radar. Obviously he's going to have ups and downs and he's going to have tough stretches. But if that's what we're getting from Yusei Kikuchi this season, if that's what we can expect, at least the bulk of the time. Um, I don't know. There's nothing to complain about. There's nothing to be concerned about. That is a golden scenario for the Blue Jays, especially in the case of Jose Burrios isn't performing, which we'll get into later. Let's not talk about that now, but you say Kikuchi deserves all the praise in, in the world, even if it was against the Kansas City Royals, who are not a great team offensively or defensively or in any regard, really. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, like, I'm not going to talk about Barrios right now, but Blue Jays desperately needed that good start out of, out of Yusei Kikuchi after that. And it was a, I don't want to call it a great start because it was only five innings, but 
he more than did his job. Obviously, the five innings, three hits, only one earned run, two strikeouts, and a walk. If you can get that out of your fifth starter or anything equivalent, maybe an extra inning or two the odd time, I see absolutely zero issue with that. Like That is something that is going to definitely make this team a lot deeper. And you talk about last season, um, I think it was either Buck or Dan. One of them was saying that essentially you say lost his job uh, last September, and he's, he's, I would say, regained it at this point. And, and you look at what was not so great about the rotation last year. You had Barrio struggling and Kikuchi. I mean, the two of them were just terrible. But this season, if you can at least get a solid one through four, if not even one through five, then I think that the rotation is just absolutely fantastic. And I think the the best part about this whole thing is, is I think this is the byproduct of the team not quitting on him. Like it would have been so easy to just pull the Tanner Rourke on him or Tyler Chatwood. I know Tyler Chatwood is a bit of a different scenario, but it would have been so easy to just say, nah, you're done. You were garbage. We need to win the world series. You're not going to help us win. But the players, and they keep mentioning this every time that he's pitching, whether it was spring or, or this, this first start of the season, none of the players gave up on him. They made sure that he was part of that group. And they made it clear that they still believed in him. And I think that, like, I, I don't want to get all sappy here, but I do think that that did, uh, I, I do think that that really did influence him. And that you could see in the game, there was so many scenarios, whether he was getting out of the inning, whether he was, uh, I think it was one where he flipped a ball to Vladdy at first to get the out. And he's screaming as if he was like prime Jason Grilly. And it shows that he truly does want this. And I think his next start is, I think, I'm pretty sure it's against the Angels, if I'm not mistaken. It's not. Yeah, so it is. Yeah, because Manoa is starting the home opener. But Sunday. Yeah, so he's got one more start in him before the the fans get to cheer him on. But I, I have no concerns about him after this point. Like, yeah, obviously the 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 fan in me from last year is like, okay, well, when's he going to come back down to earth? But as of right now, like you talk about it in in hockey a lot, ride the hot hand with your goalie. Like you got to ride the hot hand with Yusei Kikuchi and just let him pitch until he proves that he can't or he's going to struggle. And yeah, okay, whatever. It's the Royals, not the greatest team. But they do have Salvador Perez. They do have Bobby Witt Jr. They're not a terrible team. Or at least they don't have, you know, completely terrible lineup. But I'm very confident in what I saw from him. And even if, like, at the end of the day, obviously the the um, the walk in the air and run or in the three hits, even if he's getting into jams, he's still able to get out of them. And that's what d- he wasn't able to do last season. And that's what a guy like Jose Barrios wasn't able to do last season is – They'd get into a jam, or specifically with Kikuchi, he'd get into a jam, and then a you know an outing where he only pitches five innings, like last season, would be rather than one earned run, would be six or seven, and I think that's the biggest step up from from last season. And I'm just excited to see him. I'm excited to see him on Sunday, and then whenever he's pitching next to throughout the home stand. Yeah, I'm I'm glad first of all that they didn't go a Tanner Roark route like you were talking about because quite frankly. There really isn't anybody else right now in this organization uh, that we, and we've talked about that in terms of the questionable depth uh, behind Kikuchi. But of course, in all fairness to your point, at least they were at a point they were confident going into the season with him. It wasn't like they had absolutely no choice and there was just complete, I guess, risk or not even just a lack of confidence whatsoever. So I do agree that there was confidence behind the decision that, you know, we're fine with going with you say Kikuchi uh, to open up, the, uh, open up the season in the fifth spot. And of course we talked about all the work that he put in throughout the off season and everything. And just the changes that we saw, even going back to the spring and how it translated uh, a couple of days ago is the confidence on the mound. I think that was a huge part. And of course there's tons of the pitch clock stuff that we've already discussed, but it's just, for me, it's the confidence it's, and I go, I, I go back to what I said at the beginning, that home run to Fran Mil Reyes that he gave up. That was all the damage. That was it. And there was no, you know, back-to-back singles. There was no, you know, mound visits or tons of mound visits. I think there might have been one, but there wasn't a lot. And he just seemed to really get back on track after that. So that's the big part for me. Uh, another part that I really took a uh, highlight of, and I think this was something that was mentioned, was that the fact that on his fastball, he touched out at 98 miles per hour, uh, which we never saw in the spring. And his yearly average uh, going back to his or throughout his career is 95 miles per hour. So that is a huge difference in terms of, I guess, what we're used to seeing from him and the fact that he was able to get it to 98 miles per hour when he needed it. It didn't happen every pitch, but it happened at the points where he needed it. And those were some cl- uh, clutch strikeouts that he had throughout the start where he got out of it. So the, the fact that his velo got up to that point, I think that's huge in terms of him finding an extra gear when he needs that, of course, uh, throughout his rest of the starts. And I think there was a couple of bad pitches too um, throughout him. I think it was later, you know, later on in the start where it was kind of getting to the point where the bullpen was getting up and we didn't know if he was going to be able to get out of the fifth inning. And it just, there was a couple of times where he kind of, 
it looked like he was trying to do a little bit too much or he kind of had some mechanical, you know, uh, not breakdowns, but it just, he was throwing the pitch a little bit differently than he was throughout the start, probably because he was trying a little bit too hard to get out of the inning. So that was pointed out. And that was, again, corrected easily because, of course, it wasn't perfect by him in terms of falling out of place like that a couple of times. But I just, the biggest part for me was limiting the damage when he did and the fact that he was able to kind of calm down about it and to keep going throughout his start. That was definitely the deciding factor of how he was able to to last this long in the game. And of course, I agree with you, Mark. I wanted him to get to six innings. I understand the decision. Perhaps if you see this a couple more times from him before the end of the month, maybe there's a chance that we kind of give him a little bit more of that trust factor. Of course, I don't want to compare his level of trust to a guy like Kevin Gosman, but you look at a difference from today. Kevin Gosman went out for the uh, for the seventh inning, and of course, they tried to give him a shot to go through that inning. He gave up a couple hits, then they went to the bullpen. Um, I think you know that's something where perhaps Kikuchi gets a little bit of a longer leash in these games uh, if he's looking good. Of course, if we see what he or if what we saw, if we see what we saw a couple days ago, I think that's very crucial for that. So the fact that he was able to just call it quits after the fifth inning to be confident with that heading or handing things off to the bullpen. Cause of course they did a phenomenal job after he exited the game. I think that was obviously something that was huge to start off his season. And, you know, I, I also think throughout what we saw from him, of course, touching up at 98 with his fastball, uh, I thought his slider was also uh, very productive in terms of getting swings and misses. So I think his pitches were good. His stuff was there. Of course, there's lots to talk about how he, he debuted a few new pitches or a couple more movements in terms of his uh, repertoire. And of course there was a couple, I think pitches he also, or there was one pitch in particular that he got rid of. Um, and I think that was something that it just goes behind to show you the work that he did put in, in terms of he needs to change up what he's throwing in terms of the stuff. And the fact that he was able to find 98, the fact that he was able to get people to chase when he needed to at that slider, that was the deciding factor for me. And of course it was a great way from the end of the outing when he got that big strike out there to escape the jam. And of course, once again, hand things off to the bullpen in which they did a tremendous job after Kikuchi's uh, season debut was done. For me, it's not just the quality of the pitches that he was throwing, but also the amount of first pitch strikes he was throwing. Like, I don't have the number in front of me, but just watching that start, it felt like every single at bat, like, I mean, how many times last season did we see that back start 2-0 or 3-0 and then you're automatically battling from behind and you're in the hole and you're having to throw easy pitches down the middle of the plate and you're getting into these situations where you're set up for failure. And then this year, at least in the one start we've seen, he came out and he was firing on all cylinders. He was being aggressive. He was throwing first pitch strikes. He was coming after batters. When he started them with a ball, he didn't let it go two balls. He came back with a strike and even the count. I think that's really, really important, especially for someone like Yusei Kikuchi, who doesn't, at least last season, didn't have the pitches to be able to come back and account and get a guy out. So to see him be aggressive and have the control and have the pitch calling at least um, to get to that point, to throw a first pitch strike, that was really encouraging. And then the other thing, just on the length, like it also is early in the season, like you mentioned Bryson, like I think we're kind of testing him at this point. We're proving whether he can actually do this reliably and then maybe the Blue Jays will push the envelope a little bit. And I mean, we kind of saw this with Ross Stripling last season as well, where the Blue Jays don't roll him out into the sixth or seventh inning. Like Ross Stripling was kind of a two times through the order guy and then he's done. And then I think towards the end of the year, I think we saw him stretched out a little bit more after he'd proven his success, but it took a little bit. And so I think that might be the situ- situation we're in with you, Kikuchi. And ultimately, this like this is the Blue Jays' fifth guy. Like that is who he is in this rotation, or at least who the Blue Jays hope he is with Jose Barrios being a part of a different conversation. So to have your fifth guy go five innings, like, yeah, like you're gonna take that every day of the week. You're not gonna complain about having to use four innings of the bullpen with who the guy was supposed to be your worst starter. So yeah, nothing but uh happiness and sunshine and hope and optimism with you, Sei Kikuchi, which are four words we could not use for the past, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 months with you, Sei Kikuchi, and that alone is a miracle. Um, okay, so that's kind of the rotation rebound. We also saw Kevin Gosman. He put up another good start. We saw Alec Manoa put up a rebound start. Um, he had a solid outing. I do just want to mention some of the stuff that happened with Alec Manoa. Over the course of the week, we saw Alex Verdugo. He was on a podcast with the WEEI radio in Boston. He was kind of slamming Alec Manoa for his fiery behavior on the mound, especially, I mean, we kind of saw Manoa yelling at Alex Verdugo last season 
at Fenway Park after he struck him out, I think it was. Um, and so Verdugo was kind of responding to that, saying, like, yeah, you can have fun on a baseball field. You can celebrate it, but don't do it directed towards the other team. Don't do it in the face of the other team. Curry, kind of celebrate with your team. Um, which I got to be honest, I hate Alex Verdugo, but I understand that point. However, I'm on Alec Manoa's side with this. We won't get into the weeds on this. I am on Alec Manoa's side. And his response to that, which was expletive written, but basically coming from him, I don't give a crap, which was a perfect quote because I hate Alex Verdugo's guts. He is, in my mind, the worst player in baseball. Um, and I'm so happy that Alec Manoa spoke out against him. Um, okay, we won't get into the weeds on that or other pitching performances because we do ultimately have a disappointing pitching performance to get into, and that is Jose Barrios. Because we've been talking about this guy all offseason. He's a huge variable with the Blue Jays this season. And the first start, disappointed. I mean, there's no other way to do it. He's he started this season or started this series in Kansas City, and it just went downhill right away. First inning, not good. Second inning, not good. It kind of fell apart. There was a couple innings there where he did look semi-solid, semi-comfortable, but it fell apart again for him. And I think, like, I don't know what went wrong. I don't know what we want to pinpoint it as or where our concern level is. But watching that start, one thing that I came away with is just that he was really relying on his, I think, I don't know what they, the, the slurve, I think is what some people call it. He threw that pitch, maybe there was a stretch where he seemed to throw it seven times in a row. And that was in the inning where he was getting lit up. And I just, like, I don't know if this is a Jose Barrios decision or if this is a catching decision or if this is a directive that's come down from the coaching staff or the front office. But I didn't really understand when you're getting lit up, like, obviously this pitch is not working why are you throwing this pitch seven times in a row? Like it, it didn't work the first time. Let's not do this again. So that confused me and that was kind of frustrating, but obviously there was a lot of problems with that start. So that's just one nitpick with a very big picture concern for the Blue Jays right now. See, this is where I'm concerned about him is because he in five and two thirds struck out seven batters. Only walk two, whatever. It's not the end of the world if you walk two. But you, how do you strike seven out, but still get charged with eight earned runs? Like I, I don't understand this. Like, and I think the biggest thing is his command. Like, I think it was, I don't think it was him last year, but there was basically throughout the entire start, all I could see is just the balls getting hit. Even if it's a foul, I know it's a foul. It doesn't count. But every single ball seemed to be getting hit ridiculously hard, and I think. I don't know. I think I think it might be his command because you mentioned obviously those seven slurves in a row, and he's just he's just getting lit up. But then you'll see him go back to a fastball or something, and you'll see the catcher put his glove somewhere. The ball will be absolutely nowhere near that, or even if it's near that, it's a couple inches to the left or up or down, or basically like not exactly where he wants it to be. And then it's just right where the the hitter can throw it. And you hate to use this analogy, but he's throwing a beach ball out there at this point. And if you can't get the Kansas City Royals out over just under six innings, or you can't even finish six or whatever, you can't even have anything remotely close to a quality start, then I don't know. I'm concerned. And I mean, you see him at the end of the dugout after a start with his hands above his head. Like he truly does want to be better. And you go out and you see your, your, fifth starter do a lot better like he wants to be like that guy he wants to be like the rest of the rotation but I don't know it's one of those things where I here's the tough part he's signed for a long time this isn't like oh we can just you know use him for a couple more seasons like I'm, I don't even want to say a name but there's somebody the Blue Jays signed to a five-year deal if that pitcher was struggling you'd be like okay whatever it's not the end of the world if they're here for the next half or more than half a decade like He's here for a while. The Blue Jays have to figure this out. And yeah, it's only $20 million a year, but no other team's going to take that. Like, you're not going to trade him, and you're not going to give up that that amount of money. So something needs to be fixed. I think maybe it's the command. I don't even want to dare say a trip to Buffalo. I highly doubt that that's ever going to solve anything. Like, he is one of the guys on this rotation, but I don't know. Like maybe they skip a start. Like, here's the problem. It's only one outing in 2023, but it's a, really a continuation of last season and he struggled in the WBC it was okay. Once he came back in, in spring training, but he has not been good ever since 2021 ended. And I think that's just at this point, it's unacceptable and you can't, you know, as we bashed, you say Kikuchi all season, or I mean, we didn't really bash him, but people on Twitter bashed him. 
you cannot go out and, and every fifth day or every five days, whatever, and have somebody that you just genuinely cannot even with a smidge of hope rely on. And I think at this point, that is what Jose Brios unfortunately has become. But, you know, like you say, Kikuchi, he is going to start in LA or Anaheim, but he's got a lot to do. Like he, he obviously pitched with them. I think it was like one of his second or third starts with the Blue Jays was against LA in LA. So we'll have to see how that goes, but it's, it's definitely very concerning at this point. Like, again, we're seeing him struggle and we're not seeing him get out of it. Like this was the problem last season is he'd have a couple good innings. Like I mentioned the seven strikeouts, like that is good. But then you'd have those innings where he's just getting absolutely destroyed and it, it eventually cost the team. Like I know it was pretty, pretty doom and gloom for most of the game until the couple home runs or whatever it was. I think Bo hit his, hit the first home run for the blue Jays in that ninth inning. So yeah, five runs, but it wasn't anything close throughout the entire game. But this is a situation where your team was out of it very early on. And then they ended up losing that game because of it. But there's a lot of conversations that need to happen. A lot of things that need to be worked on. And I truly don't know what the solution is other than just the blanket statement of, Oh, the command's not working. Cause I think that th- probably is what the biggest issue is, but only time will tell if that's, I guess, going to be worked on because at this point, like you cannot afford to throw them out every couple games. But you have no choice, and that's why you're going to keep that's going the problem. out. He's going to keep going out, and I don't know how long that lasts for. Um, I I, I don't want to jump to conclusions either, but yeah, like it, I'd be lying if I told you I wasn't concerned. So I mean, I'm with you on that one. Um, I just. The amount of changes that he went through uh, in the offseason, or at least what we heard about and what we learned about and what we've seen, and this is like going to as far as lining up differently on the mound, all that stuff, you know, pitching under the stretch instead of a windup. Like, we're talking like a complete overhaul mechanically uh, from him. And it's just, it's not producing uh, the results that I guess he was hoping for. So, it was it was weird for him in the spring where it felt like he had a good start before the WBC. Like it felt like he was okay. You know, you saw some stuff where you liked. Um, we know about what happened with the WBC. His last or his first start when he came back from the WBC, which was his last one of the spring, it didn't go too well for him, which we discussed. But of course, we didn't want to take too much out of that because it was the spring. And then now here we are, uh, one full start later in the regular season, and uh, it's just yeah, like it's. It looked like a continuation uh, from Barrios pretty much uh, or from last year. I think the only good part, if you wanted to compare any starts last year where he got lit up, was that he was able to stretch it to six innings, which was good. I mean, he was, you know, the bullpen didn't have to get completely burnt out on the first game of a four game series. And of course, when you look back on it now, which turned out to be pretty important um, of that bullpen usage where you had Eric Swanson going out for multiple games, Jordan Romano goes back to back for saves. Uh, Jimmy Garcia has got a, a couple innings that he works to. Tim Mays was used a lot. So the fact that the bullpen was able to be kind of salvaged for the regular or the rest of the series it was very important that he was able to do that. And, um, you know, I think pretty much from what we learned about that start too, is that no one's ever questioned the stuff. Like he, he has the talent and the stuff to do it, but there, there is severe command issues from what we saw. And yeah, the slur was definitely relied upon a lot, but I think the part where he's been missing the most in terms of, I guess, location is either the changeup or even the fastball, where it's just being completely given on a silver platter over the plate. And you talk about the RBI triple he allowed to Nicky Lopez, that was over the heart of the plate. And Mark, you mentioned at the beginning, is the frustrating part was the one, two, three innings that he had. Basically, he has a, a first couple, or he had the first couple innings where he he got he looked a little shaky. It's it seemed like he settled down in the third inning, where and there was even one inning where he struck out the side, but he settled down. And then you kind of you kind of did the old okay, if he can kind of get this to five innings, three earned runs at the end of the day, I don't think we'll be happy. We'll, we won't be, you know, satisfied. I think we'd be satisfied with it. We wouldn't be overly excited about it, but it's something that I think we can get away with. And then of course he goes out in the fourth inning, and then things continue to un- unravel from there. So it's the same issues in terms of what we saw last year. Is it's a lot of mistake in location, and then it's the fact that in comparison to Kikuchi. One thing goes wrong, and it's just the floodgates just open. Like, I have never seen anything like it in terms of somebody just when they get rocked, like they get hit hard and they get hit all the way to the point where you're allowing over at least five earned runs in a single outing. It is crazy. And it's just for me, I still, and everyone talks about this in terms of 
we don't exactly know like why this happened. Like it, it just re- suddenly happened uh, last season where he completely looked completely like we saw a taste of it in 2021 when he came over from Minnesota. He was the pitcher like he was in Minnesota in that season. But then in 2022, it was just a complete switch. And the fact that you're going through all these changes, they're still not producing on the field. Like it's like it's gotten to a point where you have almost tried everything now and you still aren't seeing a lot of or you you aren't seeing the results. So I guess if you want to really nitpick and be optimistic, it was those one, two, three innings he had. It was the strikeouts like you were talking about, Jacob. Can he take that with them? Can he fix the location? I think this is something that's gonna take this is a process now in terms of baby steps in terms of him getting better. Like I said at the beginning, there's nobody else that's gonna be going out. If he can slowly take this with him and I guess work work through it. I mean, that's already what he's been doing for over a year. But really, if he can just fix one thing, and I think it's going to start translating to the other. And I think it's very easy to determine that. But the problem is, there's no answers for it, and there's still no explanation of what's going on. So he's tried everything he can. Uh, again, flashes in the start. We'll see if it translates this weekend. But I'd be lying to you if I said I wasn't. I was a concern at this point because it was a just. It felt like a complete a complete continuation from 2022 and that's the uh, scary part it'd be hard not to be stressed right now i mean like whenever you watch him pitch it's like walking on eggshells you don't know what's gonna happen and yeah i mean the frustrating part is that he seems to know what to do like obviously no like he's had this success in the i don't know it's it baffles explanation it's really frustrating to watch and i Again, you're walking on eggshells. But at the same time, like we said this with the positive outings and starts and performances from some of these guys, like it's small sample size. It's one start. We still have, I mean, in a full season, he's still got 31, 32 starts to go. So like there is an element of patience and giving it some time, giving it at least three or four starts to really start making judgments. Uh, The quick question I will ask to you, ignoring what I just said, about small sample size, how long do you give it until Jose Brios is out of the rotation? Like, if this is the start we get every turn through the rotation, does he last until June, July? Is he out of the trade deadline? Like, does he ever come out of the rotation because the amount of money the Blue Jays are playing this, paying this guy? Like, what does the kind of time frame look like for someone like Jose Brios if he keeps performing like he is right now? Again, this is way too early. This is a very provocative question that I'm asking to be provocative. And I know it is, but like, I want to ask it because it's fun. <laughs> well, it's provocative. It's definitely going to get us going. I'm, the, the problem is, I don't think he leaves the rotation. Like, I really don't. I don't think he's traded. And I said that a couple minutes ago. Who's going to take him? Nobody. I don't, I mean, unless you just underpay and get really nothing out of him. But when I say leaving the rotation, I'm like, I, I, I'm not thinking trade. I'm thinking like moving, to, like you say, Kikuchi situation mm-hmm. where you get demoted and you're in kind of a long man role. Yeah. Well, even that, I, I don't know if that's the case. I mean, An there are some reliever. Yeah. There are some pitching prospects. I mean, you look at Nate Pearson, Ricky Tiedman, but like, Telling either of them to fill in for Jose Brios, I don't know if that happens yet, but yeah, that I, I think he's gonna stay in this rotation as long as possible. Like I and maybe the entire season because I like I just I don't see the Blue Jays abandoning him right now. If he struggles and he's just like terrible, I don't know. I think the contract has a big part in it. Like they really like this this guy's a a long long term investment. So I I think that they're gonna work with him as long as they can and. We'll have to see if anything changes. I could be totally wrong. Yeah, I mean, like I, I don't know where, where I don't know where he goes. Uh, if you get rid of, or if you talk about the rotation, of course, you're talking about the bullpen thing. Yeah, I, I don't see it. I really, I really don't. I mean, you look at it last year, and Mark, you, I think you were the first one to make the point is that with this type of Barrios, and then with the 2022 Kikuchi, it was still a 90 win or 92 win team. So. You figure if you can get Kikuchi to be better than he was last year, that already helps you out by a couple games at least. I mean, we had, there was a graphic today shown about starters innings pitched, and the Jays, I think, last year, I think it was 19th from what I saw with them. So yeah, It was like 827 or something. Yeah, and it was it was comp- for a competitive team, it was pretty low in terms of what you've seen compared to the other teams that are playoff contenders and World Series contenders. So you, you 
if you fix Kikuchi to a way where he can be a serviceable fifth starter and it was a good it was a kind of a good starting point this past week, that already helps you by a couple games. Uh Barrios is still a question mark. I mean I just I don't think there's I don't think anyone has an answer for this. Like I I mean if we're struggling with to, with what to say on this and there's a lot of people uh that are very familiar with this game and this team that are struggling. I can only imagine. You'll never know. You'll never know. They will never tell you. I can only imagine what the front office is thinking, the coaching staff is thinking, everything in the organization about this. If we're freaking out about it and have no answer, like, what do you think they're thinking? And I, I think that's the scary part. And you can't even use the fact that they, you know, they have more info on this. They have more info on that. They have already tried these changes, and we have still has we still have not seen any production from it or results. So we're, whatever they have, I don't know if it's it clearly hasn't worked. Uh, and that's the scary part. Of course, if you can go out on um, on Saturday and pitch well, that's a good building block going into the next homestand where he's going to get another start. Perhaps at the end of May. We're having a completely different conversation about how Jose Barrios and Yusei Kikuchi have bounced back. That's the best case scenario. That is what we're all dying to do and go on and say about this. We're dying to see it. I think both of these pitchers are very hard not to root for. Jake, you mentioned the enthusiasm from Kikuchi. He cares. He wants this. I'm. We. There's so much talk about how much Jose Barrios cares. I'm. You got to root. Like I. It's hard for me not to root for these guys. It really sucks seeing it happen, especially to Barrios, because he just seems like a really likable teammate and a guy that's really well respected around the clubhouse. And I can only imagine mentally to him in terms of the noise, in terms of the pressure, all of that. I mean, I think he's handled it very well, number one, but like I don't really see an escape route from this, unfortunately, in terms of in season, in terms of Jose Barrios. This is a project where at the time, and I still stand by it, um, I don't blame them for doing what they did in terms of the contract at the time. Take away what you thought or you saw last year when the, in the moment when it was done, I thought it was the right signing to do. Um, of course that can, if this continues to unravel like the way it is, of course that's not going to age very well. And quickly it's going to go down as um, one of the worst contracts in this franchise, but that is obviously way down the line and hopefully a point that we never get to. All of us want to see him succeed. I just, I think at this point though, their hands are tied in terms of other than, you got to throw him out there every five days. If that's twice through the order, like you're talking about, Mark, and get him out of there, that's fine. That It's just there's something that needs to be you, – you need to build something here with Kikuchi – or not with Kikuchi, sorry, with Barrios, where you can be acceptable of what he's doing. It's just we haven't seen it yet, but for me, they're deadlocked. I don't. I, don't, I really don't know what they're going to do. Uh, I don't even think a Phantom IL stint would work. I mean, I don't know any of those possibilities that would be beneficial to him. Uh, this is something that he's going to complete, or he's going to still have to continue to work through. It's just concerning that this has been a thing that's happening now for over a year. Yeah, you feel for the person, you feel for the player, you cheer for the person, and you cheer for the player. Ultimately, I don't know what's going to happen, but I think, bottom line, no matter how he pitches, he's staying in the rotation. Like, agree. If he has this start thirty-one more times, we're going to be ripping our hair out and banging our heads against tables and but like we're still gonna be here like i i don't know i i have a really tough time seeing the blue jays taking him out of the rotation with the amount of money he's making and also the fact that there are no replacements like you're really gonna take out jose brios and put in zach thompson like no and jacob before you say it they're not putting nate pearson in the rotation it is never happening so like you're not putting Zach Thompson in there. You're not putting Trent Thornton in there. Maybe Mitch White, when he's healthy, takes that job. But, like, I really don't see that happening. So, yeah, I, I, you cheer for the guy. You cheer for the player. But right now we're kind of stuck with it, and we'll see what happens. But uh, while we're on the topic of players who are underperforming to start the season, let's just rip the Band-Aid off and talk about Brendan Bell because he's had a terrible start to the year. Like, <laughs> knee surgery or whatever the hell's going on with him aside, his start to the season has been awful, and there's really no other way to say it. And I know guys start slow. Like, that's the thing with early season episodes on this podcast. It's small sample size. We're going to overreact. It's guaranteed. Uh, but he hasn't looked good at all. So I'm curious, I guess, how patient you guys are with him, how much you think he's going to bounce back. Like, is is he going to bounce back? Is this who Brandon Belt is this season? Obviously, he's not going to be, like, 
whatever he is now, like a 0.050 hitter. Like he's not going to be that over the course of a season, but there is genuine like injury concerns, surgery concerns, whether he's fully recovered from that, how long that recovery is going to take, what he looks like when he's fully healthy. Is he past his prime, which he obviously is, but how much good years does he have left? Like all those considerations go into this. I'm curious what patience level you guys have with Brandon Belt, I guess, after the start of the season that he's had. And I will clarify this by saying, like, when he was brought in, I didn't think he was a guy who was going to be starting every day. And, you know, I talked about my first impressions of Dalton Varsho with Brandon Belt. My first impressions were they're bringing him in to be on the bench a lot of the time because Vladdy's the guy at first and Alejandro Kirk is going to be at DH when Danny Jansen is starting. So Brandon Belt isn't going to get a whole lot of playing time. And so I'm happy. I'm still happy with him in that position. If he can find stretches of the season where he can get it going and become a reliable bat to either pinch hit late in games and be a lefty matchup or start against certain pitchers. Like I'm happy with him in those situations. If he can get it going a little bit more, I, I just don't think he's really in a place to fill the role the Blue Jays have him in right now, which seems to be a semi-regular starter. I'll be honest, when he was first signed by the Blue Jays, I was not a huge fan of it. Like, I just, here's the thing. Obviously, I'm going to cheer for him because he plays for the Blue Jays, but I don't think that they needed him. And I say needed because obviously, what am I going to say? They don't need him, but I didn't think that it was I'll necessary. disagree with you. I think they needed him because of left-handed bat. 100%. Well, yeah, that, I mean, that's the problem. Being a lefty, he obviously does add versatility to the lineup, but I think the team's a little crowded. And I mean, I'm not going to divert too much here, but you look at their infield. They got Espinal, they got Merrifield, Biggio, Bell. Like they got, in my in my op opinion, I think that they have a little bit too many, or too, their infield's too overcrowded is what I'm trying to get at. Like, I think that there are too many players competing for too many positions and then you're seeing guys that I think should be playing every day or shouldn't be sitting on the bench that are sitting on the bench and that are playing instead of not playing. But I'm not, I don't know. I think that with, with Brandon Bell, it is early. Like you said, like you remember a couple of years ago, Danny Jansen started the season like over 32 or whatever it was and finished the year off quite strong and then finished 2022 uh, on a very high note. But I, it's just one of those situations where he's just struggling. Obviously, he's only one for 15, 17 plate appearances, 15 at-bats, nine strikeouts. Like, it's it's low. Like, he has a, a double, I guess, is a good thing, but it just seems as if every time he goes up, he's swinging at just a lot of pitches and missing a lot of pitches. And today, he almost had the golden sombrero, but thankfully, his last at-bat was, a, I think it was a fly out to the right or the left fielder. So, at least he's putting the ball, bat on the ball, but yeah, it's one of those situations where it's early. I'm not overly concerned, but I think that the 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 one thing that I will disagree with John Schneider is or on is playing him over some players. Like if you're going to keep Kirk out of the lineup so that Belt can play first and Vladdy can DH, or if you're going to you know not have Merrifield play so you can have Biggio play. I, I'm not to get into that can of worms, but I think that the the problem is that there's so many infielders, and now you're having the situation where players who shouldn't be playing every day, especially if they're struggling massively are now playing every day. And I do hope that he turns things around. Obviously he is a lefty. He is, I think a leader in this clubhouse, although he did just come here, but I, I don't know. I think he'll eventually get back to what we can expect out of him. And we're def definitely not going to see this pace of like almost half of your at bats or half your plate appearances or strikeouts. Like we will definitely won't see that, but only time will tell. I think with guys like Brios belt, We'll, we'll just have to let the games uh, transpire. And hope maybe another thing we have to remember, they've been on the road for a long time. Maybe just getting back to Toronto will help a lot of these players rebound, but we'll have to see what happens, I think, in LA. And whole, I mean, the whole team seems to be on a good note after the winning streak, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, uh, I have a, I definitely have a different mindset to you in terms of why they brought him in and what his role was. And for me, even when he was first brought in, he was brought in to hit majority against righties. And then a guy like Alejandro Kirk was going to hit a majority against lefties. And this was a way, and this was noted upon, and there were numbers to prove this. Uh, Alejandro Kirk, his first half compared to his second half, there is a dramatic difference uh, in terms of that. And a lot of the conversation was he was overworked and he burnt out. And that was a fact. And of course, a lot of that 
was or had to do with Danny Jansen constantly going on and off the IL. But Alejandro Kirk had a lot going on last year where he was catching for the first time, of course, in his big in the big leagues where he was catching multiple times a week and he was overworked and he kind of it felt like near the end of the year he ran out of gas. So the point of bringing in Belt, I do not disagree with whatever or what at all. Uh, it's the point of bringing in a lefty where it gives you an option where you don't have to DH Alejandro Kirk every single time he's not catching. And at the time, of course, when you brought him in, the, these were all the scenarios uh, in terms of why he was brought in. Of course, it's easy to say now it's not working out, of course. But I go back to what I said the last episode. I, I'm I'm not overly frustrated with it. Of course, it's noticeable. I mean, it's gotten to a point where it's noticeable. You're talking guys like Matt Chapman, Dalton Varsho, who are just killing the ball. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is having a great year as, as, as well in terms of approach. The power is finally coming around. When you see that, and then you see Brandon Belt striking out after three, four, or five pitches, I mean, it's very noticeable. And that's my pet peeve is that there is no, there's a lack of contact right now uh, from what you're seeing. Like, it just, I, he just seems lost uh, in terms of, I mean, the way his body language, the way he's kind of just walking back to the dugout every time. I don't know. If it's he's just very good at hiding it in terms of emotion, but uh, it's definitely something that he's got to work on. But I just I go back to the spring. Um, this is a 35 year old guy who had major knee surgery, and clearly, and this was teased upon at the end of the spring at the beginning of the year, and now it's clearly something that's true. Somebody who did not get enough reps in the spring uh, at the plate, and perhaps he's not ready right now in terms of the workload that he was going to get, and of course, just the speed and everything. I think that's very. I think we can come to the conclusion that that's the case right now with Brandon Belt. But I, I, I like. I still go go by it. I'm willing to be a little bit more patient with them. Of course, ideally to open up the year, I think it's fair to have an even split between him, uh, hitting against righties most of the time, and then a guy like Kirk hitting a lot against lefties and DHing. Of course, that might change a little bit. We've already seen Belt move down in the order. We might see Kirk get a little bit more reps than we have to start the year, but. It's also not helping because a guy like Alejandro Kirk has been struggling too. And this was a guy that also showed up late to camp. And there's he looks a little bit behind in his timing, especially at the plate. So they're in a situation now where they kind of have to keep throwing out Brandon Belt, I think, in that DH position. Unless there's days where, you know, Vladdy's DHing or George Springer's DHing. And then, of course, you can get an extra guy from the bench to go in the outfield, uh, which we've already seen in a series or which we saw today when Whit, Whit Merrifield is playing in the outfield. And, of course, Kevin Biggio play, has already played the outfield at times this year, too. And then I go back to what you said at second base, Jacob. I, I don't have any problem with Biggio and uh, Whit Merrifield splitting it in terms of a platoon. It's a lefty and it's a righty. And then I think it's just something where at some point, and this goes for Santiago Espinal as well, at some point throughout the year, they're going to go with a hot hand. But I think to open up the year, I don't think you can be con- – I don't think you can complain about – people splitting time uh, and currently w- with what they're doing. I completely understand with what they're doing. I just think right now, going back to Brandon Belt, this is something that he's going to have to obviously work through, but it's clear that he's not ready in terms of his timing or anything like that. Again, Alejandro Kirk is, isn't exactly helping his case either in terms of uh, being up to speed with everything. So they're kind of in a situation where both of those guys just need to figure it out, in my opinion, of course, at this rate where we are right now. And I'm not expecting Brandon Belt like you said, Mark, to play like he did in 2021. But I think there can be a nice common ground where he can still be productive and he can still be a guy from what we've seen throughout his career that is a consistent big leaguer who gets big hits and gets or has good moments. We're just not seeing that right now. And I think number one for him is to strike out a lot less and start putting the ball in play. And I think after that, the course of his timing is going to eventually catch up to speed and hopefully it's not too much longer. Can I just say quickly, like, and I'll, yeah. like when I'm looking at, a lot of his strikeouts. I mean, he's unfortunately striking out a lot, but I'm, I noticed there's a lot, lot today. of strikeouts to look at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, big sample size on that one. But I'm seeing after he swings, a lot of them are swinging. Not a lot of them are looking. I mean, at least today there were a lot of them swinging. You can see him like he'll swing the bat, and then his head just drops, and he looks, I think, a little bit deflated because he knows that these games do matter. And I do hope that he does better. Like I, I don't want to see anybody struggle, but yeah. it's just it. You hope that it eventually. Uh, resolves itself yeah and Bryce I don't know if you would agree with this but like I take your point about Alejandro Kirk's workload but I think there are other ways to get around it like to me right now at least if you're taking Kirk out of the lineup if you're not having Kirk at DH right now I would rather have Whit Merrifield or Santiago Espinal or Kevin Biggio in the DH spot right now like that's just 
because I think they're better offensive players right now than Brandon Belt is. To me, it looks like Brandon Belt is slow. It looks like he's not ready for Major League Baseball. He's not ready for game action that isn't spring training. Like, I don't know if you stick him on the IL. Like, I, I don't know if you can really do that at this point now that he's been on the roster and he's healthy. But I think, like, he needs more time. That's what it looks like to me. Like, he's... I have faith he's going to get there eventually. I think he just needs more time. And so I don't think the Blue Jays should be relying on him so heavily so early in the season. So right now, I think putting Whit Merrifield out there as a DH is more productive than having having Brandon Belt get up, gets at bats. I, I don't know if you agree with that person. I see it. I definitely do. I just, it doesn't completely handcuff them in a, uh, a situation late in the game for any defensive replacements or everything like that. But well, like for if you, like if you have Kevin Biggio at second and Whit Merrifield's yes. DHing, like you still have Santiago Espinal off the bench and in the outfield, you still have Nathan, Lu- Nathan Lucas. So like, yeah, it's, pass. It's again, they're not handcuffed by that at all. I just, yeah, like I don't, for I don't think I don't know how close we are to seeing that. Um, yeah, right now, if this could, like it, it's just for me, I need it, it needs to keep happening until I think they yeah. eventually start doing like they've already moved them down the order, like I said, and then they're they're kind of rotating him and out with Kirk right now. So I think, I think that's step one. And then I, I'm not ready to get to that point yet, but I, I definitely don't think uh, it's definitely not real. It's definitely not unrealistic. I definitely think that that's a chance. I just don't think that's something they want to do right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's, uh, I mean, we're pretty much out of time, but I'm just going to mention a couple of other things that happened in this series that I'm sure we're going to be talking about in the future. Um, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is heating up. He had his first two home runs of the season, back-to-back games yesterday. And today, as we record this on Thursday night, uh, he always hits well in Kansas City. That streak continued, um, and it was good to see him get the home runs out of the way. And not just home runs, but he's had like, what, 29 walks? Or not 29, nine walks and one strikeout to start the season, which is just phenomenal. Um, and that was obviously a priority for him coming into this season. And I don't know, he's been doing great. It's been really encouraging to see his start to the year. A um, couple other things. Matt Chapman, I think we mentioned him a little bit. He had a good series um Kevin Kiermaier had some good moments in there and then um one guy who had some not so great moments out of the bullpen was Trevor Richards who hasn't been good at all to start the season I know we've talked about him a little bit off and on in spring training in the off season but I'm sure I'm sure there's going to be a moment in this Los Angeles series where we can bring him up again next episode and we can have that full discussion when we have time so to throw it to Los Angeles we've got three games against the Angels to give you an update on our standings of our our series predictions. This past week, I predicted the Blue Jays would go 3-1. and one. Bryson, you also predicted 3-1. and one. Jacob, you went 2-2. Two and two. So normally, since Bryson and I got perfectly right, we would get four points each. Jacob, you would get two points each. Um, but we made the executive... I, I made the executive decision, I guess, that you get plus one for a perfect series guess. So I guessed uh, every single game correctly. I guess they would lo- lose a Brios game, win the next three. Bryson, you would say they would win the Brios game, lose the Kikuchi game. So because I got the game right, I get plus ones. Right now, the final standings are six points for me. Bryson, you're at five. Jacob, right now you're at one point. So you got a little bit of a comeback to make. So we'll be keeping Whoa. track of that. What did I get in the first series? Season. The first season, you got uh, negative one because you thought the Blue Jays would sweep. Oh, and yeah. they went one and two. So unfortunately. No problem. Um, anyways. So, now series predictions, Los Angeles, the weekend series, last series before the Blue Jays get home. What are your thoughts? I'll just quickly go over the pitching. Like, you're looking at, I mean, the LA Angels, unfortunately, not the greatest team. You got tomorrow, you got, or today, if you're listening to it on Friday, you got Chris Bassett against Patrick Sandoval. Looking for a rebound out of him, you get Barrios against Tyler Anderson on the Saturday, and then Sunday, Blue Jays ace, Yusei Kikuchi against Reed Detmers. I think two out of three is fair. Um, I'm going to say they lose the Brios game, but they win the other two. I, I, I'm i just going based off of pitching. Obviously, a lot of things could happen, but I wouldn't be surprised if that's how it ends. The best news for this team is that they do not have to face Shohei Otani uh, from the mound. Of course, they are going to have to face him at the plate, but I think that's very important to note that he will not be pitching in this series, thank goodness, uh, for the Blue Jays' sake. I mean... You got the two wild cards from what we saw the last time through the order going, and that's Chris Bassett, who, I mean, we we saw the first start. Um, Jose Barrios, who we spoke about for a lot of time to basically say we do not know what's wrong with him. And then for Yusei Kikuchi to go out and hopefully continue the momentum. 
a sweep tempts me, but I'm not going to do it. I, I just, it's only on the fact of Jose Barrios. I just can't do it. Um, I got to go two out of three, and I, I'm probably going to actually say what Jacob said in terms of they're going to win two out of three, and the game they're going to lose would be the Barrios win. At this point, you got to show me before I'm going to start giving you that respect, Jose. So I hope it, I hope it comes really soon, though. Okay, well, if you don't take that gamble, I will. I'll say they they win two of three, but the game they lose is tomorrow night's game. I guess probably today's. You're listening to this. Chris you think Bassett's, Bassett's going to pitch well, or no? No, I don't think he is. I think oh, they're no. going to lose that oh, game. No, um, and I think they'll win bad. the real start. Uh, I don't know. I I just I got to be different than you guys. Who knows? I'm probably making a dumb decision. I'm betting on Barrios, which at this point in the season is not a good idea. But anyways, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Either way, we all say two and three, so that would be a good start for the Blue Jays. So next time we talk, we will be one or two days away from the home opener, from seeing the renovated Rogers Center, which we got a little bit more of a sneak peek of today in the uh, kind of unveiling the, the ribbon-cutting ceremony. So that was exciting. But we will be close to that. We already are close to that. As always, you can support our podcast by checking out our social media. That is at Section138Pod, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. Um, if you head to the link below this episode or you head to the link in our bio on any of our social media, you can find our link tree, which can direct you to our YouTube where you can watch our episodes. Also directs you to our Buy Us a Coffee page, which just helps support what we're doing. And also can direct you to join our Discord. We've got about 75 members, 75 listeners on our Discord. We're going strong. You can come and talk about Jay's, Jay's games with us. Um, and then the last thing I'll say, West Coast Series, we may miss some games because of sleep. But either way, go Blue Jays. We'll catch you next time.